The way you reduce the noise in many of these things is better filters on the light. So you remember those properties of lasers that we talked about with respect to them being monochromatic in a very short or narrow wavelength? Mm -hmm. What that means is that they're only one color. So if you can filter that one color in the receiver here and very narrowly focus on that, then you will block out the rest of the sun's light essentially, which increases your signal to noise ratio in that case. All right, everybody, we've got a good one lined up here. Now, uh, every once in a while, we've mentioned this before, we'll mention it again. We get we have these podcasts where there's really smart people across the table from Mark and I, and and we're yeah, I'm I'm almost nervous going into these because I don't know what I don't know, and I want to make sure that we're asking good questions. So, uh, just in case, Mark and I are joined though by Nick Vitalbo of Invisti, which we'll get into what that is, and we'll let Nick uh, introduce himself because this is his first time on this particular podcast. Um, and then we also are joined by our very own Rick Campbell across the table. So, Rick, you are an engineer here at Vortex. You haven't been on this podcast either. You're also going to make sure, because you work on things, uh, all things range finders and a number of other things here at Vortex, uh, you make sure that, because uh, you know Mark and I, quite well at this point we're asking good questions and then you pick nick's brain too because you well you and nick have worked a ton together on two of the products or one of the products for sure here on the table in front of us uh that i think we'll get into talking about but anyway um that's the that's the intro part i'll quit being like cryptic and whatnot we'll just get into it let's just jump in jim rick you got to introduce yourself though because i before we get to nick real quick since you haven't been on yet it's first podcast ever this is my first first podcast ever so, uh, Rick Campbell, I'm a work down in product development, uh, project manager here, and I uh, kind of lead all the laser range finders um, that we have in the works and have uh, produced in the last uh, three years. Been here about three years, and I've been working with Nick ever since I st- actually technically before I even started here. Uh, I was on a call right after I was hired. <laughs> uh, I was asked to sit on a call with Nick right after the on the day I was hired. <laughs> so I've been working with him since that day. Nick and day Rick. one. <laughs> yes. We're you know, probably. I didn't realize that actually. I had no idea that it was even I wasn't even to- yeah, technically I wasn't even here yet. I didn't actually start for another uh two weeks. <laughs> so Rick <laughs> Rick was just playing it cool. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just threw him to the wolves right there. He was he had to act like he knew everything. But uh yeah. Uh, he's a great guy to work with though. I've had nothing but a, an excellent experience working with him and the rest of the guys there. So it's been a, a really fun experience for me and, and Rick's awesome on his side. So I really appreciate him being that counterpart over there. Awesome. So explain that Nick a little bit because you uh, have worked with Vortex on a number uh, of different things here. Um, and yet you don't actually work at Vortex or for Vortex. Correct. So uh, Correct. introduce yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name, obviously, Nick Vitabo. I am the the president of a company called Envisti. Envisti, it's interesting. We have, uh, sometimes you'll notice I wear different hats. Uh, and the reason I say that is because Envisti's specialty is really in laser range finders and um, laser beam propagation through the atmosphere. And we'll get into that. That's what my actual background is. Oh, it's, I hope yes, we do get into that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. And... At the same time, though, I act as the chief engineer for applied ballistics. And so um, my background is primarily in lasers and ballistics, and it's kind of a combination of those two things here. Um, Now, I've been at this probably for about a decade or more, and uh, the company was started in 2011 um, to basically service the the sporting optics industry um, with the design and manufacture of laser range finders, optical wind measurement devices, and anything you can think of along those lines. Uh, we're a small team. We've got uh, basically six or seven people, depending on you know, our workload that work for us full-time or part-time. And then combined with the applied ballistics team, we've got you know about 20 people total. So uh, we are the team that's primarily responsible for all of the, the products that you see, like the, the Kestrel and things of that nature, um, the Garmin watches and whatnot that um, – are implement the applied ballistics uh, solver inside of them. So how does somebody decide that 
they're just going to get into all of the most complicated things on the planet. I mean, you're talking about literally freaking laser beams. <laughs> Excuse, um, uh, Jen, let me stop you right there. Laser propagation through the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laser beams. Uh, so you got into lasers, and and you're combining that with ballistics too, which is we've got podcasts that we've done actually with the guys from AB. Um, ballistics just inc- incredibly a complex thing unto themselves, and you're doing app development and all this stuff. I mean, there's people who are making a complete career out of just one of those things and and doing all right for themselves. You just decided, why not mix all three? Or maybe even yeah, more, yeah. I don't know. It depends on how much you want the backstory here, but I can kind of fill you guys in on it. It's, it is kind of interesting. Um, I can yeah. do the short version for this. Sure. Um, sure. So myself and some of the other principal engineers over here at Invisti, we started at Lockheed Martin. So we came from a defense background. Um, when I started and I came out of college, I started working there in, in Akron, Ohio. And the very first program I worked on was uh, jamming heat-seeking missiles using lasers. So what you do is upon the missile's launch, you track it. You then put a laser beam on it. And I can't go into the specific details, but you do certain things to that missile with the laser to steer it off course. And Can so our range uh, fighters do that? <laughs> I could make them do that, let's say. <laughs> okay, maybe that would be That's awesome. Go. I'd be ranging a deer one second, then a oh, missile. I think we may have trouble with the eye safe category after that, though. Okay. Anyway, yeah, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> but you did save the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But uh, that background uh, in pointing acquisition and tracking, it's called, really got me into a couple of different areas. And the next uh, application we worked on was uh, basically using lasers to communicate over uh, very long ranges, like up to 200 kilometers from some of our um, ISR, you know, uh, not satellites, but like YouTube planes and stuff from their HD cameras down to the ground and such. And so I worked on a bunch of that stuff. And then this was all DARPA work. So if you know anything about DARPA, it's like they're the government's research uh, branch basically. And they do all these crazy ideas to see if you can be you know, moderately successful. Gosh, um, and then really eventually uh, got into optical wind measurement based upon that stuff. And that's where things got tied into ballistics. So you can measure the wind by shining a laser on a target and looking at the reflection of that. And from there, the natural application is to put that into a ballistic solution for a shooting solution. Basically. Naturally. So, so that's how that all works. Does the wind blow a laser? The wind blows <laughs> and it causes scintillation in the laser which you can observe so that's oh. what you can see i just know that this is going to be a good podcast can right. we okay. can we back up a sec because you said something <laughs> yeah. and i just want to i guess clarify you guys were transmitting sound for communication through a laser is that what you- we were no we were doing video so okay uh one of the big things that happens in the military if you want to it, back when all this uh hd tv like you know uh, 1080p kind of cameras let's say you had a bunch of them on a, a plane or something like that that you wanted to uh get the data off of them well previously the best way to do that was actually to record the data and then onto hard drives land the plane and get the data off of there but that's pretty slow and so what they wanted to do was look into ways of getting that off the aircraft um, you take, you know, uh, a multiple streams of 1080p video coming off of these air assets, and then you beam that down to the ground using lasers um, to a collection aperture, which then you, you know, convert back to, um, you know, video basically on the ground. So that's that's, that's the kind of stuff we were doing. That's incredible. But we'll stick to we'll stick to sporting optic <laughs> lasers yes. here for the majority of the rest of this podcast. But it does. Um, it's it's sort of uh, hearing those kinds of things are reminiscent of when you walk to the top of a mountain and you realize how small you are, 
And like when we come to the end of finally developing a rangefinder that's like a sport optics rangefinder, and then you're like, wow. And then somebody says, well, we're sending videos 200 kilometers to planes and or whatever with lasers. You're like, oh, okay. So I guess ours is like pretty good, but not, you know. Right. Like the, like <laughs> a laser rangefinder is fascinating, right? Yes. There's a lot going on there, but then apparently there's not a lot going on there. Do you know what's interesting like, about all this though? And this is kind of why you said, oh, how do you get into this? How do you do this? Those systems there that I just described have all of the same fundamental components that a laser rangefinder does. Do they just and have a bunch more horsepower or something? Or I, sort of, yeah. But basically, all the same techniques and fundamentals are used regardless of the application. And so, it's a much different application that we're talking about here with respect to laser rangefinders. But all of it's the same. There's a transmitter in your laser. There is a receiver. There's a you know, it's called an APB. Same fundamental components. There's optics to collimate the light going out. There's receiving optics to bring the light in. I mean, actually, you can look at the laser rangefinder in the same exact way that we just talked about with respect to the air assets. Um, okay, so real quickly, you've got an airplane flying down here. Yeah. And you've got a ground station here. You want to send the light from here to here. So you're transmitting the light, you're collimating it. And then your, your ground side is receiving that on a, on a photo detector. That's the exact same thing within a rangefinder, but now your transmitter and your receiver are co-located. And so oh, you're basically okay. using the target as the reflection. Okay. Yeah. Okay. C can we, um, can we maybe, can you describe real quick? Um, I know what it is, but I also don't know what it is. Somebody asked me to, to explain it. What is a laser? How is it, you know, there's, Visible lasers, there's lasers you can't see with the naked eye, and then there's lasers that are you can't see with the naked eye, and you also can't see under night vision. And I mean, there's all kinds of different lasers, and it's some kind of light, but it's not your average light. Right. I don't, what's the deal with lasers? <laughs> uh, well, so, um, do you know, laser's an acronym, right? Did you know that? Not at all. No, I Okay. Like idiot. Stands for light amplified by the stimulated emission of radiation. That's what that stands for. But it's, okay. it's like the perfect name. If somebody, like a caveman, somehow invented lasers, and I just feel like it makes so much sense that they just called it a laser. Like the English language I'm, had something from Latin that was direct. It just works so I'm, well. I think it's because we I'm, use that word to describe so many different things. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, I'm sure it's one of those things they backfit, you know. <laughs> Some people, they did it like that. Um, but the way it works basically is that uh, enters all kinds of different lasers. Uh, it would, we could do an entire series on just the different types of lasers. But, but basically what it is, is it's, uh, there's two important things about um, lasers. is that all of the, the photons, which is a, 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 if you can look at light in a couple of different ways, either as a particle or a wave, and I'm sure maybe you've heard about that before. But all of the, the photons... And um, are basically coherent. So they come out all in the same phase. And so when the light is transmitted out of there, all of the light comes out um, uniformly, let's say, um, is the easiest way to describe it. Um, and they have other special properties too. They are usually very narrow in their wavelength. And what I mean by that is like when you look at the sun, the sun has emits white light and white light is comprised of anything from all of the colors of the rainbow, essentially, as you remember Roy G. Bibb from grade school. Um, now a laser has a very narrow line of light. And so um, what that allows us to do is when we're working with uh, lasers, it allows us to very finely tune what we're looking for. So when we transmit and we receive, we know exactly where that light is in the spectrum there. So that's the, that's another important. So they're, they're coherent and they're monochromatic is the name for it. So those are the two important properties, lasers. Okay. Now, um, like I, we did a we did a podcast on rangefinders, it's kind of a more base level podcast. This is this is certainly maybe some more advanced stuff here, but um, you know I think that a lot of people pick up a rangefinder. Like and and Rick, this is one you're excited about a lot, and I'm sure you can get into it in a bit. But here's the Fury Five Thousand with applied ballistics in it. Uh, they pick up a rangefinder like this, or something like the Razor Rangefinder over here, just a regular monocular rangefinder with really great performance. Um, and they think it's kind of a magical computer box in their hands that just sort of 
it always works. It works in any conditions. You just point it at anything you want. It'll tell you how far away it is. But this all relies on that laser being able to uh, leave the optic, go out to the target, reflect, come back, and then um, even there's a lot on just how well the computer can dissect the information it's receiving back. Um, so you're talking about, you know, these, these wavelengths of light. And, you know, I know, for example, sometimes if you're ranging into a low angle sun uh, situation where the sun is ri- right down in um, almost your field of view on the horizon, that can kind of screw with the computer or the receiver or whatever. I can't re- actually, I already can't remember what you called it. Um, the receiver, though, on the, on the optics end, because now it's trying to filter through all this extra light information it's it's getting. Is that kind of like what's happening there? When yeah, I, I'd say you've got some of the general concepts there. And if you guys wanted, to, <laughs> that's a nice way <laughs> to of dive into. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to dive into the specifics of it, we definitely could here. So please do. Yeah, please do. Because I, I think that's that's one of the the mysteries of just the average the average user who picks up a rangefinder and you know you pick up a Fury five thousand, you pick up a Razor HD four thousand. And sometimes you wonder to yourself, why can't I range 5,000 all the time? Or why am I pointing at something and I feel like I'm, you know, I, I hit the range button once and I get one distance, I hit it again, I get a different distance. There's just all these kind of mysteries around range finders, I feel like. Yeah. And yeah. somebody like you or Rick actually kind of understands how to break them down. Yeah, I can take what he says and I can, I've got a, a simple example after he gets done. To kind of explain it, <laughs> okay. That it's, it's some of the Translated. training that I, yeah, the training I give to where it kind of it gives you a visual to what he's going to talk about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let actually, I'm going to use the the Fury 5000. Now, what's interesting about what you'll see with these Fury 5000s here is they are a little bit different than the way you see them. I get them without armor and such. <laughs> yes. Um, so this for if anybody's watching this on video, this is not what yours would look like <laughs> if you yes. got it new out of the box. <laughs> Absolutely. But they, they work for good demonstration. I, I want to first go into some of the fundamental components of what happens. Um, all right. First off here, uh, we've got a, a transmitter and a receiver side. Okay. So obviously the way laser rangefinders work in their most like simple approach is you emit a pulse of light. Okay. And you start a timer and you, you uh, basically allow that laser to propagate or, or go to the target and reflect off the target. And once that light is returned back to you in the receiver side, you stop it basically that timer. Okay. And so the speed of light is a constant and if you know the time that it took, it's a really simple calculation to figure out, okay, the, it took, I don't know, 50 nanoseconds or whatever it took for the light to come back, the speed of light you know, and therefore, and the time that you took, you can figure out what the, the distance was that, that light actually did travel during that time. And so wow. fundamentally, that's how it works. It's what that a simple. finite little timer. Yeah, I mean, it's really fine. That's, in, that's incredible to even... I mean, the human brain probably can't even discern 50 nanoseconds. No, not even close. (laughs) uh, But that's why we've got electronics to do that stuff. Well, yeah. So, however, now what you talked about with respect to all of those things that allow, you know, the magic to happen, I I really boil it down to a couple of different things. I, I usually talk about it with respect to signal to noise ratio, okay? What that means is that the, the higher the signal with respect to the noise that you receive, uh, the more likely you are to re- get an accurate range return from the target and that that range will be an accurate range. And so I always put it in terms of signal to noise. So the things like you were talking about there where you've got the sun beaming down into your eyes or into the binoculars, what you're actually in that case happening is happening is that you've got more noise and therefore your ability to get a range back is compromised. And so Hmm. we can go into all these little details, but um, fundamentally the way this all works is you put the light out one barrel basically here uh, and there's optics in here to collimate it so that the laser beam just doesn't spread out all over the place. It forms a nice tight beam. You get that onto the target and that light's reflected back into here received onto the photo detector and the time that it took to do that 
is the basics of what the rangefinder does. Okay. Gotcha. What what other types of things would be considered noise then? You know, yeah. we're talking maybe about I mean, would that be stray light, I guess, or just yeah. interfering yeah, or just, light? Yes. Yeah. The okay. atmosphere itself, what that's like. I mean that you know if you range it the indoors. sun is the yeah, the sun is the primary noise contributor in uh, a rangefinder, uh, okay. and and so that's why rangefinders will work better at night, basically, because there's there's less sunlight. Hmm. Um, so there's only so many ways that you can kind of improve your signal to noise ratio, and this is why I talk about this a lot during our seminars and such. But one of the really interesting things is you can relate all of this to audio, and this is the way I usually talk about it quite a bit. Um, so. From the perspective of uh, increasing your signal, it's pretty obvious. I can talk louder and it will get louder in your ears. I can increase the signal to noise ratio simply by talking louder. So when I talked loudly there, my signal increased to you, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing here. You can put out more laser energy if you want to increase your signal to noise ratio. Now, there's limits on that for eye safety purposes, but that's one way of increasing the signal to noise ratio. Um, and that would increase your ability to range a target. Uh, the second thing is, is you can form a tighter beam also. Um, that way, if the beam is tighter, more energy resolves itself onto that target. So in an audio world, if I were to cut my hands like this and talk at you, even though it's the same level of signal, the microphone here is receiving more of that because my voice isn't spreading out. It's more focused on the actual microphone so yeah if we're in an audience or you and i were talking directly to each other that's one way to do it um the third thing you can do pretty easily is you can increase your receiver size so in your case what you're doing is you could cup your hands like this if you were listening to me directly all around you your ears your ear size essentially hey make right? like a satellite dish mm -hmm. huh. that's exactly what, how this works so if I wanted to design a rangefinder that ranged farther, I could put out more power, I could collimate the light to a tighter beam, I could increase the receiver aperture size, or, and here's the really interesting one, and this is where the real magic of these rangefinders come in. You can emit multiple pulses of light, okay? And this is how the smarts within these things work. Okay. Now. I described the most simplistic scenario that I could when describing how these things work. I said, okay, I emit a pulse of light, it returns from the target, and then I stop the timer when it returns. Now, in reality, we can't put out those used pulses of light because it's expensive to do that and it becomes potentially non-eye safe. And so what we have to do then is we have to lower the overall output power in that peak. And what we do is we spread it over a period of time. And so the way most of these rangefinders work is such that we emit a pulse of light, we look at the return, and then we do that like a thousand times. Okay. And Jiminy Christmas. the thing, yeah. I thought he was so, going to say like five or 10. <laughs> yeah. Like a thousand <laughs> times. And so if I said the same thing to you a thousand times, even if I whispered it, you would probably pick up little pieces, parts, along the way every time I did it and you'd be able to put all that together. Well, that's exactly what the rangefinder is doing inside. Hmm. So you're, you've got the ability to increase your signal in that case by basically repeating the same thing a thousand times um, and summing that up. So that's how you increase the signal. And the way you reduce the noise in many of these things is better filters on the light. So you remember those properties of lasers that we talked about with respect to them being monochromatic and very short or narrow wavelength. Mm -hmm. What that means is that they're only one color. So if you can filter that one color in the receiver here and very narrowly focus on that, then you will block out the rest of the sun's light essentially, which increases your signal to noise ratio in that case. Are there colors that are optimal for that then? Like certain colors do better? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So is that secret? Different I know. Wavelength. No, it's not. Okay. There's different wavelengths of light that transmit through the atmosphere better. Um, than others. And so you can do an atmospheric transmission model to see what wavelengths transmit are and are not absorbed by water, for example, or are, are absorbed by water. Now, most of the laser rangefinders that you see here uh, in the commercial marketplace are around the 905 nanometer range, okay? 
And this is kind of an important number. And the reason I say that is because your eyes themselves see everywhere from the ultraviolet, which is around 350 nanometers, up to the red spectrum, which is around 750. So it's a very narrow, like 350 to 400 nanometer band that your, your eyes are able to detect. Now, when you're working in, with laser rangefinders, you don't want to put out UV light. That would be like very dangerous. So well, we've moved to know. the infrared spectrum. So greater than red in terms of how long the wavelength is. Um, then 905 compared to 750 nanometers where your eyes can see, it's very close in wavelength, which it's cheap or lower cost, I'd say, to manufacture components that work at that wavelength. But the detriment is that your eye will take all that light and basically map it down onto your retina. So you have to be a very careful in terms of not putting out too much light uh, so as to not make it eye safe. So you'll see on a lot of laser rangefinders, they have a classification like class one, class one M, class three R. That is actually the amount of light over a period of time that rangefinder puts out that gives it a certain classification. And knowing that 905 is close in the visible spectrum or close to the visible spectrum, you're very limited in how much energy you can put out. And that's, but that's where commercial laser rangefinders operate. However, in order to uh, gain greater signal, essentially, we talk about putting out more light or more power. Uh, to do that, military devices have gone to longer wavelengths that don't map down onto your eye. And so in that case, the longer the wavelength, your eye no longer focuses that light. And so you can put more power out without compromising eye safety. And so those are the, the trade-offs you do. So it's usually a cost versus performance kind of model there. Right. Okay. Got it. Yeah, because I was wondering to myself, you bring up the things that can help you be able to range further. And one of them, I mean, everybody's natural reaction is is more power, right? So like crank it up but more, more hearse purse jim yeah exactly exactly yeah we've been watching uh you've been watching car videos <laughs> um but uh what uh, what was i what was i getting at there well so i'm wondering to myself and then you bring up the eye safety thing you know is there some magic number that range finders sport optics range finders will just never be able to go beyond because i mean it's like since range finders have been a thing and especially in the last couple of years you had uh rick you've probably seen this too you had man, 1,000 yards, that's big time, mm -hmm. and then 1,500, and then 2,000, and then 3,000, and now you got, you know, 5,000. And, uh, are, like, are we eventually finally going to hit a wall with this, or, or are you just going to keep doing the other things that you mentioned, like making more giant receivers or emitting more well, pulses or something? It, well, it's, it all comes down to that. So that, that's actually a perfect uh, segue into the next thing we could talk about here regarding laser rangefinders. So Excellent work, John. Uh, Nick and I called each yeah. other this morning. <laughs> so we talked uh, for a minute about like the, the Ranger series of rangefinders. Those are the, the monoculars, handhelds, okay, versus maybe like the Fury 5000s here. Um, so one of the very first things you'll notice is that the, just the – Obviously, these are binoculars, but the thing that allows the Fury 5000s to perform at greater ranges is the fact that you've got a binocular with, uh, I think these are 42 millimeter optics, mm -hmm. right, Rick? Yeah. Yep. Give me yep. Thumbs up. So you've got a much larger receiver aperture than you do on some of the, the monoculars. So that's going to sure. increase your signal noise ratio. Comparison for um, the camera. Well, and we don't have a uh, a ranger here, but I think the receiver on the ranger is smaller than the, than the razor, razor 4, even 000, a little bit, yeah, isn't it? Is, yeah, this is uh, twenty five millimeters, and uh, that one is twenty two. So okay. we've got mm -hmm. an, we've even got an extra three millimeters of Interesting. diameter. Interesting. Yeah, so that's that's definitely one advantage you have. So you could just continue to make these bigger, which you know that that does increase the receiver size and it increases the signal to noise ratio. Um, also, when you're putting out the amount of light here, you uh, there's a couple different things you're looking at with eye safety. How much, you know, what the peak light is, but also how much that's spread out also. So if you're using this full aperture to transmit that light, you can imagine the average power, you know, 
per area here is smaller. So mm. you can use a larger aperture size to transmit the light too, which makes it eye safer. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. How about, um, so the one thing I noticed that you didn't bring up is, uh, you know, I'm thinking you're out and it's dusty or it's real humid, foggy, rain, even raining slightly, yeah. a drizzle in the air, um, snowing, uh, that I would assume would be noise, but you, you were saying the primary thing is the sun, sunlight. Are well, those other I'd things say also? The majority of, yeah. Okay. Well, those are all, um, uh, noise factors in there okay. also. So it's especially, uh, well, actually the way like fog would work, for example, is that the light hits it and it causes a scattering effect sure. off of that fog. And so, what it's not a direct noise component. What it's doing is it's attenuating or lowering the overall return of the signal back from the laser. So uh, same thing with dust. Um, rain, believe it or not, doesn't influence it that much depending on the, the size of the uh, actual droplets. It's just the way the light goes through those particular uh, size of drops is different than like a fog, for instance. Hmm. And is um, that the way the laser light is going through it or the way the sunlight is going the through laser, it? The laser light. Okay. Yeah, the laser itself. And it, it's because basically uh, when you start to get, like you can imagine um, the, the water droplets are very large compared to the wavelength of the light. And so they don't really well, mess with it too much. Whereas the fog particles are smaller and uh, do have a, a scattering effect there. Okay, so mm. that's the main difference there. And then snow is like having falling prisms. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's like. That's what it looks. I mean, it's usually kind of sparkly, especially if it's snowing on a sunny day. It so looks it's, real sparkly. It, it just scatters everything everywhere. So that's why snow is like if you've got a big snow bank, you can range the snow bank. <laughs> sure. <laughs> of of the snow falling. Okay. That's yeah. as far as you're gonna be able to get through it. Um, and then snow too. I mean, if you're even, if it's not snowing, but there's snow on the ground, you've got sunlight up above and sunlight. I, I, as a Wisconsin boy, who's a relatively fair skinned, I've gotten sunburn just from looking <laughs> down at the ground, uh, on a sunny day in Wisconsin, uh, more times than I care to admit, but it's, it, it gets bright all around you. So I imagine mm -hmm. that's a lot of noise, right? Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, some of the worst conditions to try to range in are sunny, snowy days, mm -hmm. like or just snow on the ground along the path in which you want to shoot. Hmm. That is just like worst case scenario. Interesting. The enemy of your laser is light. Yeah, it's the, funny. The because, irony, Jim. The irony there. And it's funny <laughs> because on a sunny, snowy day, if you're out deer hunting, the deer kind of pop out a little bit because they're just these dark bodies moving along a nice white, it's bright out everywhere, mm -hmm. you know? So you just think to yourself, man, I can see it plain as day. It should be able to just, you know, range, but. Well, then there's, and I'm completely sidetracking now, so forgive me, but there are those days when it's really sunny and it's bright out and it almost like overloads your eye. Like it makes it oh, very well, difficult to see, sure. right? Yeah. Does that, is that what's, Similar is that similarly happening, or maybe that'd be more of like an optical thing, I guess. But no, it's well, that's kind of what the laser rangefinder is seeing mm -hmm. essentially is that that same overloading to your eyes that you're seeing is the same thing that's hitting the detector as well, and, okay. and basically is is noise there, yeah, for sure. Hmm. And then you've got depending on what you're trying to range, uh, just think of it. This is my little analogy that I use. So think of it, you got like a tennis ball. I throw the tennis ball out. If I'm hitting like a street sign, the whole tennis ball comes back. Okay. If I throw out a tennis ball and I'm hitting a deer, think a marble comes back. That's all that's coming back. And I got to try to discern that marble from all the other tiny marbles that are coming in. And Oh, okay. You know, so all these different stuff are coming into that detector. And depending on how you have it set up and depending on the signal strength of what you got come back, it could just get washed out and the might yeah. not be able to discern it. Now, you're getting into the fact that different targets actually will then affect because the deer hide is going to absorb is it for lack of a better term or yeah. some of that some of that laser that hits it before it gets to come back so you're just getting less information coming back yes you're okay. getting that and it's also reflecting some of it off in different ways just because of the design of the, the shape of the body sure sure yeah because it's not a nice flat reflective <laughs> surface um and then sometimes too even just different colors of targets right mm -hmm. so uh explain i know some some archery guys will run into this like dark black targets um, get brought up from time to time. Uh, what's what's happening there? Yeah, so there's 
Uh, one of the very classic things that is hard to deal with in the laser rangefinder world is a, a pure black target or a pure white target. And the, the reason mm -hmm. for that is because, as, as Rick alluded to, it's the, the reflectivity of the target is dramatically different. And so um, just like you described a moment ago about your eyes, like kind of like it being too bright, your eyes are saturated in that case, okay? So what happens is, is like at short range, a white target potentially can saturate the detector such that you put oh, out a bunch yeah. of light and the detector just like blinds itself. Just like if you shine a flashlight in a, in a camera, it's the same effect. Um, okay. And yeah. so the range that you would detect in the case of a saturated target, a white target that's short range, and this is a particularly a, a large issue with archery since the ranges are shorter, that saturation causes a different range result than compared to the black. And so that's the, like a black target would not saturate in that case. And so that's a, a very classic uh, example of you can, one of the things if you're, uh, you know, if you are into archery and want to do hunting um, at those ranges, go to the store, pick up a, a range finder, range a black target that's roughly the same distance as a white target and see if you get different distances. How you handle those things is really determines the quality of the range finder for archery there. Okay. Hmm. So like a higher quality range finder with a better determining computer brain in it might be able to filter out what's happening there and give you the same like the same range back if they're at the same distance or yeah are all range finders going to have a difficulty with that or uh, I would say that the ones that are properly designed will have handled that situation. Okay. It's pretty easy though how you deal with that um, from a range finder perspective. Remember how I talked about how you. Uh, basically emit a series of pulses over time, like mm -hmm. a thousand pulses. Okay. So what you do is you emit a few pulses and you determine if the light coming back was saturated already. And if it is, then you back off the power a little bit and then you emit a couple more pulses. You keep backing that power off oh. until you reach the point where you're no longer saturated on that white target. And what you end up with is uh, an accurate range for the target at that point. Hmm. As soon as you hit that point of saturation on your detector though, you're basically, you can't tell what that distance is. Okay. And so better range finders will do that backing off of the power until you actually get a uh, target that you can, is a non-saturated uh, yeah. detection. Uh, now, Rick, this kind of explains a little bit how there's, uh, I know on the Razer 4000, there's like a best mode. I, Isn't that how it works? It's called best, right? It's a normal mode. Or normal mode. Oh, normal is best. Yeah, this we is best. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, but like there's a mode where essentially you as the user are saying, you know, hey, it's okay that I'm not getting the fastest response out of the rangefinder, but I'm just going to let the rangefinder emit these pulses or more pulses than usual. So it may take a second for it to give me the range. And when I say a second, I'm not being literal. I'm saying, however, it may take a, a moment longer than I'm used to but it will have emitted more pulses to give me a more accurate I think range. That's Isn't that ELR, what's happening? I think that's the ELR. That's mode. the ELR range. Okay. All right. For the, so it, for the getting the max distance. Okay. Is that what's happening? Yes. So pretty much it's designed to allow, it's kind of like what Nick's been talking about. It, it's basically building the target out of the noise. So if you've got a very small target that's at further ranges, uh, you put, you take this, you put it, uh, the razor, you put it on a tripod. That's when it's best used for this and you basically you hold the button down and it's basically just continually hitting that target and it's building that target out of the noise yeah. and then it says yep that's a really a target out there and here's your distance and it spits it back to you okay the normal mode in this is the standard mode of what you get for all the different range finders it's basically the largest reflective target is what you're going to get back okay so okay. got it so yeah it's like if you gave a an artist he said Paint me a painting in five minutes versus paint me a painting in however long it takes you to paint it really nicely. Right. And so you're going to get different results. Hmm. Okay. Done. There you go. <laughs> how, do, how, does that, how does that differ from regular scan mode? What's going on with regular scan mode then versus like that ELR with the multiple pulses there? Where so you're, regular, well, you're holding the button down for both of them, right? Yes. Yeah. So the regular scan mode is just using this. It's not using any different type of uh, uh, processing. It's basically just scanning for everything you're just hitting the same pulses over and over and it's basically just it's reporting everything that's hitting okay gotcha whereas elr you may not get anything at first 
Gotcha. It's just building something. If it does get it, then it'll just report it, and at that point, you're done. Okay. Yeah. So it may it depending on what you're trying to hit, it may take longer. Um, but if it's a reflective target, and let's say where this right here is, you know, like the Razor Four Thousand, a reflective target at four thousand yards using the ELR mode, it's instantaneous. But trying to hit a deer at that two thousand yard mark, it may take a second or two, um, depending on the environmental conditions, to be able to get that um, target to be able to build it. Gotcha. So that's where this thing right here definitely wins as far as how we increase that distance out. Well, and that's hmm. where that tripod comes into play, too, because you need to make sure that you're on the target during that entire process. Because yeah, as, as the target gets further away, um, any type of uh, scattering or any type of reflections coming off and you're moving all over the place, you may be missing some of the targets. You're just sending errant laser reflections <laughs> all over the place. So this thing is like what we talked about. It's only 25 millimeters you know, in diameter. Mm -hmm. So as you, if you're, if you're moving in a, a shape of that, you could be missing all those different things, which is one could increase your time or you may never get a result. Right. Hmm. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. <sighs> wow. We're learning about lasers, Mark. There's a lot going on. <laughs> I never Jim. thought, I never thought of it happen now just to put lasers on sharks. Um, and Nick's over here smiling because from where I started three years ago, yeah. this has <laughs> come a long way. <laughs> yeah. We've come a long way. I'd say, uh, <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to comprehend all this stuff because you look at a device like this, and like you said, it's like magic. It just, you press the button and it, it either does or does not return a range. When you start to look at the complexity under the hood of all this stuff, there's a lot of thought and, and uh, design that goes into all of this stuff. Right. And it's not obvious to an end user what all these things are because you can't see how it's operating. Right. It's not like a bullet or ballistics where you look at it and you say, okay, I can, uh, you know, increase my muzzle velocity or do all these other things, things that you have control over. In the case of the laser rangefinder, you don't have any control over the designers did, And so those are the, the things that are difficult because, you know, also you can't see the light go out. So you're not really yeah. uh, able to quantify that. Yeah. So. You just have to kind of trust that it's going out there. There's not an actual <laughs> red dot out there somewhere or whatever color yeah. it is. Um, now here's something interesting, by the way. All right. Um, this is just like some, some interesting thing for the moment. Um, so I'm talking to you on my iPad now. Okay. Remember how we talked about these lasers not being visible um, yeah. and different wavelengths of light? Well, silicone detectors, which is what's, you know, in most cameras can detect this light. So check this out. Um, if I get this just right onto my camera here, I sh it might saturate, but you should be able to actually, if you take your, like your iPhone or something, look at the actual... Now, don't do this with your eye. You'll see the light coming out of this transmitter here. Oh, yeah. oh wait. Uh, yeah, I do. Yep. As, as purple. So if like, I continue to scan, and you might be able to – it might just be too dang bright in my office here, but uh, you'll be able to see some of the purple light coming out of here. So oh, it's kind of interesting. Um, you can actually see that with the phone, which – remember how we talked about earlier um, the difference between some of the military laser range finders versus other ones? Uh, they've gone away from wavelengths that are easily detectable by cameras and cell phones and things like that. So as to um, make sure that you don't broadcast your position and such when you're actually using a laser rangefinder. Better Makes hiding. Perfect sense. Yes. Um, can you talk about uh, Can you talk about one thing that gets brought up time to time um, is beam divergence. Oh, Jim, you stole it from me. You, uh, <laughs> you, you brought up how tight you can make the laser. Uh, yep. that helps certainly because instead of just sending out some flashlight, uh, you send out more of a concentrated beam. Um, Rick, and then I know talking with you, uh, guys and the engineers, it's not even necessarily just tightening up the beam so much, even though you want to do that, but there's also then different shapes of beams and, the, or can, and the orientation and the orientation. Uh, so, um, that's weird. I always just thought they were just circles, like they are in uh, TV, yeah, but in, in the movies. No, I was thinking about that too, Jim. Because intuitively, I can picture, you know, the the you know the binocular laser range from binocular or the handheld range finder, and doing certain things to focus that laser, so you get this like this pinpoint accuracy of what you're trying to get, right? But then also, it needs to come back, and y you know, it's not like you're like, ha, you know, got it, like. It almost needs to be, I feel like, broader on the way back than it does on the way there. Maybe right. it's the same. What's going yeah. on there? Okay. Um, wow, well, where to start? Okay. So. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's right. That's how I know. We, that's how we know we've asked a good question. Yes. Yes. Okay. So every laser 
as it exits its aperture, uh, exit aperture, immediately starts to diverge, okay? So if you can imagine, let's just say my thumb is the emitter here. As soon as it exits there, it's going to spread out, okay? Okay. And the size of the um, emitter is actually going to drive what the, the size of the um, – or the amount of divergence that happens with the laser rangefinder there. So the greater the aperture, the less it's going to diverge. Oh. Um, the smaller the yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I hate doing things like math on on uh, well, I'm not <laughs> oh, I do too. I, I forget so. <laughs> simple simple things. It's just as yeah. soon as yeah, you're on a podcast, math. I just say doing working. I know right? math in general. But but um, so what you have to do is you have to and I kind of said this earlier, collimate that light. And what that sure. means is you have to kind of wrangle down that beam divergence somehow. So the, as it comes out of that uh, laser emitter, it's going to be very broad, like a number of degrees. It's going to look even broader than a flashlight. What you need to do is you need to tighten that beam up. So, um, and it, that beam doesn't ever like focus down to a point um, on a target or anything like that. It's still wide, but you want to narrow it down as much as physically possible mm -hmm. um, within reason. So, the there's trade-offs though you can uh, narrow it down but you have to have larger optics in order to do that and it decrease your beam divergence um but then you have larger optics which means more weight which increase size all those kind of factors play into it so you may not necessarily want to do that so usually you trade off between having a tight enough beam divergence that you can get enough signal back but that you can you know trade off the weight and the size there. Now, how big that beam is on target is usually beam divergence is described in terms of milliradians. And that's really easy if you're using like a mill, you know, mill scope. Oh yeah. You can imagine what that looks like on the target. Sure. So most uh, commercial laser rangefinders are on the order of one to one and a half milliradians in terms of their actual beam divergence. So you can imagine what that would look like in your scope. Um, now, a larger beam divergence will also, though, allow for the ability to hit a moving target easier. Because you can imagine oh, yeah. if you had a really tight beam and you were scanning across an object, um, that would be harder to do than if you had a bigger beam and that object was moving forward or through it. You would have a greater probability of detecting that target. If the large of the larger beam divergence there, so there's all these like little things you got to consider. When the best way to hit a movie. fly is with a big giant fly swatter instead of like a mini one. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, cool. And these and so like this right here is 1.5 by 0.1 millirad. So basically, it's 1.5 and it's only 0.1 tall. That helps to increase in the rate, increase in the range because if it was orientated vertically, you would actually start hitting the ground and start getting oh. returns back. So by doing it horizontally allows you, and only having point one mm -hmm. allows you to get further ranges. Now, you determine doing that um, over... Uh, horizontal versus vertical makes sense. Mm -hmm. I get that. Um, does it have to be oblong? Like, is, is there an option to just make it a circle laser? Uh -huh. Or do you want it to be oblong because of the reason you brought up, Nick, which is you have the chance to hit something that might be moving or I th I think uh there there are definitely some rangefinders out there that are that are circular. It's just we chose to go this route. Yeah. I like I'm, how technical do you want to go here because very there's a reason for that by the way <laughs> that those lasers are like that. So mm -hmm. I I'm in. Okay, you're in. All right. <laughs> so you remember how we talked about different types of lasers early on here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the most common lasers used in especially commercial laser rangefinders is what's known as a laser diode. So it's just a small, um, basically monolithic piece of uh, laser. It doesn't have any other parts to it or anything like that, um, except maybe a cooler or something like that. But essentially, the uh, laser diodes have uh, two axes. You know, it's like it's a rectangular emitter size. So it's not a square. It's not a circle. It's rectangular. And that shape of the laser actually ends up projecting itself out in space. So the, mm. the, you can actually determine that it's a laser diode in there based upon the shape that you're seeing uh, of that laser. Now, what you can do, if you wanted to make a circular beam um, on the target, what you'd have to do is you'd have to make a lens that sits right on the front of that 
laser that's kind of like a, it would look like a rectangle and it would look like one of those, like those magnifying glasses, you know, that you put on the sheet of paper and it kind of magnifies it. That's what it would look like. Um, it would be an aspheric lens that goes on there that looks like a rectangle. And um, those are particularly difficult to machine too. And to yeah, make. So that's one of the reasons why you may not want to do that. Okay. I remember okay. hearing about how a spheres were more difficult to make. <laughs> um, huh. Okay. But it's all a function of the actual components that are used within that laser. So yeah. that's the, what's, that's what's driving a lot of that stuff. Now, it's you know, fortuitous, basically, that in the case of laser rangefinders, that you'd want to have a broad scanning beam like that where sure. you, want, you don't want to scrape the grass. You want to make sure that you're hitting the target there, um, but that you'd want to pick up something on a hillside or something along the ground there um, you know, horizontally. It works out nicely. Yeah. Um, one other quick question I had, uh, that may get technical. Um, okay. So you discussed actually the laser diode thing itself. I heard somebody once use the phrase and tell me if I heard it wrong or I dreamt it or whatever. I heard somebody once say something about growing lasers. Yeah. Okay. There's are okay. they alive? <laughs> what what's happening? Sort of. Uh, um, organic. Remember how I talked <laughs> about your camera being of a certain material material like silicone? Yeah. So in computers and anything, there are um, semiconductors, okay? And any semiconductor material ha- is usually born of a wafer of some sort. And so in this particular case, you have you have to create the substrate material on which these devices are actually manufactured. And, um, you know, it can be out of all kinds of different materials. Um, some of these um, materials are really exotic and rare earth metals and things like that. But I'll use a camera as an, an example. It's silicone. And so you have to actually grow the silicone crystals, and then you finally shave those wafers from there. Uh, and that becomes the the actual detector. So That's so cool. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, it's these kind of things that I think make it fun when somebody goes to the store and they just pick up a rangefinder. Like, ah, yeah, I got a rangefinder. I can range stuff. It's like somebody had to grow something for there to be a. Ah, it's <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's a yeah. new type of farmer, Jim, right there. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I oh, and this is there. where you know. It's, so if you get down into the fundamental components of all this stuff, it, you just, it, it's a whole field of study. I mean, right. that's, that's, what we, that's what we do for a living, you know, and it's, it's kind of interesting to, right. to do that. Now it may not have anything to do necessarily with, um, you know, our, our, our sport optic range finders, but you think, um, like I think of like, well, I guess that would be, I guess when we're talking about speed, like, can you determine the rate of speed with lasers for different applications? Sure you can. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the way to do it is um, you don't really do it directly. You do it um, like, well, okay. So the, the easiest way to do it, I'd say, is to determine the range to target multiple times in a row. So like going back to how the scanning works that Rick talked about a few minutes ago, that scanning window is like, you know, about, it's about a quarter second. Okay. So if you took a range every quarter second off of a target and then you track it as a function of time, now you know its rate of speed. And so you can very easily determine how fast that target's moving. Um, yeah, that's a lot easier when the range is like increasing with respect to time, like the target's moving away from you. It's harder to track it horizontally because then you need to like instrument the device to see how fast your laser range finder is rotating. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's obviously possible for sure. Yeah. This is, uh, we use that technology, sorry, in the, in the Navy quite a bit. But if you did that, um, at that point, you're, what we call illuminating a target. So at that point, it's kind of like an act of aggression. So, but oh. yes, I can track somebody and get their speed and you get exactly their altitude and everything just by doing that all from a laser. Right. Actually, that's what uh, police are starting to use now too for catching people speeding instead of the radar. Yeah, they got LIDAR. Oh. LIDAR? LIDAR. So they can detect and if you're is lying. Is that actually L-I-G-H-T? L-I-D-A-R. L-I-D-A-R. Interesting. <laughs> um and then, well, and then, we, <laughs> and then, when they say, "Hey, do you know how fast you're going?" That's when you uh, lidar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe next time you get a speeding ticket, you could ask um, what his signal to noise ratio was, and if it was 
uh, less than sufficient, then he couldn't determine your speed versus the car's next to you speed. Or actually, you could ask about his beam divergence. Yeah, beam divergence. Yeah. Then it might hit the car I next think, to you. I think I've determined that if I'm going to speed, I'm going to do it in a bright white car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm going to actually put a bunch of lights all over the car and just absolutely just project as much light as I can. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate you stopping me. A quick question for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we got to talk a little bit about Fury, uh, the Fury 5000 AB here. Um, Rick, nice work. And Nick, nice work. Uh, this thing's pretty cool. By the time this releases, this podcast releases, it, it'll be out. You know, this will be part of maybe uh, maybe the launch or some something like that. It, it'll be pretty fresh. Um, so, We've discussed everything that's gone into the range finding portion. Uh, now, Nick, this gets into part of the thing where you found yourself in like the most complex fields of work ever. Uh, and Rick, now you're having to decipher all the things he's talking about and help it make its way into this binocular. Um, so we have extra features going on now. It has to be able to communicate with an app. Um, which there was app development then, because it's actually like a Vortex app that you'd get in the store, right? Yep. Um, so it has to communicate with the app. It's got Bluetooth on board. Uh, as, you know, it's sending out these signals, they're coming back. There's all sorts of sensors. Uh, yeah. Yeah, all kinds of sensors in there. Um, what all What all is happening in here? How is this all, how is this all working, coming together? And then, and then also, um, how is the app able to tether in with it and actually figure out what's going on too. I'll take this one, Jim. Have you seen the Terminator movies? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know that. what? Yeah. yeah. You got it. Like now it makes, it makes perfect sense. So the, so the ballistic, so the applied ballistic, we have the applied ballistics elite solver in here. Mm -hmm. So this is their top of the line. Um, the solver is resident on board uh, the Fury AB 5000. And then the app is used to display uh, anything from that, or you can change your settings on board the rangefinder directly from the app. The app is almost like it's just like a, a your view into the brain of what's happening in this binocular. It, it's almost like an extension of the binocular, right? It, it's your input into what the binocular uses. So you can create your ballistic profiles uh, on here, and then those profiles are uh, loaded up into the rangefinder for use. And okay. you can have multiple profiles listed, but only three can be used at a time, and only one is being used in here. So you can have three uploaded, so you can easily switch without having the phone, and, but only one is active at a time. So if you've got a 223 or, and a 6.5 and a 308 only one, uh, loaded on here, you just have to choose which yeah. one you want to be using at that point. Two guys going hunting. I've got Mark 6.5 loaded up in there, and I've got my 308 loaded up in there, mm -hmm. so I can range for Mark's gun, and then I can switch over when I'm shooting, and we can range for my gun. Something like that, too. I mean, you're not going to be able to shoot that far with your 308, Jim, yep. so, I mean, probably won't even need it. And then, uh, <laughs> well, I found, uh, you know, some mo with some modern propellants and a, a good ramrod, <laughs> so seat it really well. Uh, another way that you can actually use that same scenario is if Mark had a Kestrel with applied ballistics on it and had his uh, profile loaded in there and your profile was loaded here, this will actually connect to an applied ballistics Kestrel it will send the Kestrel what it needs to do its apply ballistic solution, and then you can have your 308 here, you can have his 6.5 there, and you guys, you do the ranging, but you both get the same. You get his, He'll get his solution, you get yours. No way. Yes. Oh, man. Everybody's shooting, Jim. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds complicated. Like, that almost, making all that work... All the zeros and ones almost sounds more complicated than just making a rangefinder. It work. was really easy for me to just tell Nick, "Hey, I want this to work." Yeah, yeah, it was a blast. <laughs> let me tell you. Actually, I, I will say this: this is, I would say, the most well thought out laser rangefinder I've ever worked on in terms of the wow. functionality. That's pretty big time. Um, all of the feature sets and things like that. It's really a complete package, and I don't say this just to sell the darn thing. But I am. I mean, we're. I'm proud of the work that we did on this. Um, it's got a complete sensor suite. So, you know, in order to shoot, you need a bunch of sensors. Like, you know, obviously you're entering in your, your bullet data and stuff like that. And that's all the stuff that's driven from the application like we talked about. But in order to make this stuff happen uh, instantaneously to, you know, do that solution, you need uh, temperature, pressure, humidity sensors. All of those are built on. You need to determine what your inclination is. And that's a pretty standard thing. Uh, on most ranger, the range finders. But one of the other things that we included within this device is a compass. And so 
you can get your, your azimuth. And there are some really awesome wind features that Rick came up with with respect to how to use the rangefinder to acquire the wind's angle, take the delta between that and the range to your target to very quickly change what your wind influence is and things like that. And this rangefinder has all of it. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's a really cool product to use. Um, there's just a lot of features packed into it. And it, what's amazing is if you'll pick up the normal Fury 5000s in this one, there's almost no difference between the two in terms of form factor, but we've included all that in software and electronics inside of this housing. So it's pretty neat. Yeah. The only visual difference is the <laughs> extra buttons on the left side and the little Bluetooth uh, connector thing on the right side that kind of just barely nubs out on the bottom. Just yeah. enough. To yeah. See. You know why that's there? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to quiz you guys, by the way. Why is that there? Uh, this thing here. Uh, yeah. When your phone talks to that thing, what's important? I used that word a few times today. Um, the uh, lasers, the receiver, the lasers. signal to noise ratio. Oh, so, okay. So you put the Bluetooth thing out of all the noise that's happening in the computer back here in the binocular. You got it, and that way your antenna is sitting outside of the metal housing, so you have an increased signal to noise ratio by putting that antenna outside. So it's the same thing. How about that? Yes, learning. <laughs> The more you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, ding, ding. Did you, uh, did, so were you like developing apps for taking bombs out of the air at, at, at your previous job? Like how did you get into the app development side of things? That's That's got to be a whole new bag of Almost worms. out of necessity. You know, I kind of foresaw that uh, back in, you know, probably about the 2013, 2014 timeframe that, no devices were going to be standalone anymore. And so I kind of forced myself to learn how to do Android back in the day and then later iOS. But the the first application we did was for the, the Kestrel 4500. I called it the Envisti Companion Pro. And it only ran on Android because Android was the only one that supported Bluetooth Classic at the time. But the whole internet of things that you hear about, how like your, you know, your, your, uh, thermometer and your hot, you know, your uh, thermostat in your house is connected to the internet and Alexa's and all this stuff, that internet of things. Uh, we're really applying that here at the range finder level. And I kind of saw that that was happening within the industry itself uh, in different areas and figured it would be a good time to pick up application development. Now, you know, it's not just me, it's the team too. We've got a lot of great guys that do a lot of application development. Some of those guys are pretty specialty um, with respect to application development, but it is pretty neat how all that stuff applies, you know, just the same way that you you can order stuff online by talking to Alexa. You can do control and manipulation of the rangefinder directly from your phone. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Because, yeah, you can even you can even be on your phone and have the rangefinder set up somewhere or whatever. You can even fire the laser from your phone. I mean, you can do all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff, uh, which has been we went through the training on this and, uh, and once you get it down, there's going to be videos out there too, for all those who are wondering on the, on the main vortex YouTube channel, all that stuff, you can go and figure out how to set all this up. It's, it's really pretty intuitive. I mean, there's certainly more buttons, uh, to use. So uh, there is a learning curve, but it's, it's not the most complicated thing ever, um, by any stretch of the imagination. And, uh, you know, I guess it's kind of funny because I think to myself, especially in the hunting side of things, you've got um, a industry that has advanced a great deal in many ways, but has kind of, um, there, there's sort of a, and whether it's just by choice or for whatever reason, um, the technology influences in the hunting industry, people have been a little bit nervous to take them on. And it could be because, you know, hey, if, uh, for example, I shoot a trad bow, because I just think it's fun, right? right? So, I mean, if you're just into that because you're into it and you don't want to have all the technological aids, cool, you know? But um, a lot of people these days I see going out into the field, they have their phone on them because they're on Xing. Yeah. And uh, then they have a ballistics calculator of some sort on their phone. So, inevitably, when they have to take a shot at, you know, 400 yards or whatever... Um, instead of just doing the old Kentucky windage and hoping for the best, cross your fingers, uh, they give it a range and they go into their, um, ballistics calculator or they go to their range card taped to their stock or they go to whatever. Um, and then you're looking all that stuff up already. If it's just all right there and it can just kind of 
uh, you know, because it displays too as well the ballistics information in the display on the rangefinder. So you don't even necessarily have to have your phone out. Your phone can just control all the settings and whatnot. You can put it in your pocket and then just range with the rangefinder, and it'll tell you. It'll say it on the phone too if you happen to have it out or you happen to be with a hunting partner. But it's pretty slick, and I feel like it's right. Maybe in terms of my own comfort level with technology, it's right up. Is it's still in my comfort level where I'm not like I don't feel like I'm cheating or like you know I didn't laze the deer with the rangefinder the deer just fell over because I put a laser on it you know there's still a lot more that Yet. you as the hunter have to do <laughs> yeah yes you know uh, that's actually one of the big things that like when we started doing a lot of this like back in the the DARPA days uh, while I was working at Lockheed Martin the measurement of the wind and things like that almost became cheating in some respects but the way we've always viewed these things is it's a tool you're going to use that tool how you want and we want to make the best tool and let you decide how you want to use it how you employ that thing within your hunting or shooting situation and that's where we try to make it easy to use and and as i'd say configurable as possible because there's all kinds of different ways in which people are going to use that tool yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna be able to increase your effective range. You're gonna be able to make a more precise shot. And I think when you know, I mean, obviously, this is like a long range laser range finding binocular mm-hmm. with ballistics. There's a lot going on there, right? And I think sometimes people want to talk about you know the ethics of that, but also part of that ethics conversation is you're gonna be able to make a very precise shot, right? Mm-hmm. On on a game animal, right? And mm-hmm. so. The more precise you can be, the more effective you can be, the, the faster you can uh, and confidently dispatch that animal. So it kind of, there's definitely a circle of there things is. there. There is. For sure. I actually didn't think of it that way. Yeah. So uh, on the app, it's funny you should mention that, on the app, if you're on your uh, the display screen, the ballistics display screen, at the bottom, it's going to list out all these uh, different uh, parameters that went into doing your shot. Well, also it gives you a calculation of the energy that your bullet will have on the target that you range. Oh, yeah, that's so there, super interesting. So, therefore, you can actually determine, based on whatever you're shooting at, as to whether or not your bullet will have enough energy to do, to perform an ethical kill or not. Yeah. So that can be like, oh, I shouldn't take this shot because I need 700, you know, I need 700 foot-pounds, and this isn't going to give it to me. Well, and that, so uh, Muck and Hearn and I were talking about this because uh, I was uh, going on a hunt a little bit ago, and we were figuring out my dope, just using the, you know, classic dope card, right? But depending on where I was going to be was going to determine, you know, I guess the the effective, you know, optimal energy that we needed to expand that bullet. So mm-hmm. if I was at uh, here in good old Wisconsin, my max range was probably 600 yards. Where I was going, my max range to open up that bullet uh, for expansion was 700 yards. So um, that's really cool that that's going to do that for you yep. real time, no matter where you're at. Um that that's uh, I like that. Yeah, that's and you handy. Can, and you can do that prior too. So once you get up into your stand or blind or wherever you're going to be sitting, you can range different spots and you can have an idea already in your mind of, well, I know that that tree line right there is as far as I can effectively shoot. You can know that prior too. Yep. So yep. if you need to make a quick shot without even pulling this out, if you've ranged, you can even range and create your own dope card if you want right there on the spot. Like, you know, yep. just either one, just have it taped to your taped there or you can just use this to range it your target right immediately you know the yeah. deer walks out you can range it yeah. then it'll give it to you well and it's this is to the yard ballistic data you know i'm used to like ah, do i make do i go you know in 25 yard increments do i go in 50 <laughs> yard increments Correct. and this is yeah. like no this is this is to the yard and, and i'll say this and and i've been in a situation where i didn't get an opportunity or because i didn't have something like this right be, because I ranged, checked my dope card, you know, and it looks like a you know Excel spreadsheet. So then I double check my dope card just to make sure I'm going to dial the right dope. And by that time, poof, you know, animal took a step and it was gone. And it wasn't that far of a shot. I think it was probably, I think like four, four fifty or something like that. Mm-hmm. But definitely something where I wanted to have, you know, dial the proper, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. adjustment there yeah. and uh, something well, like that. The other Good thing, chance we got them. The other thing, too, I remember watching you shooting at an Ipsic with um, your very, very nice custom rifle uh, the other day over at Isaiah Curtis's yep. place. Shipped and, it off for a photo shoot, Jim. A little nervous. Oh, man. it's Wow. Um, mine's still here. 
See, that's the nice thing about no. not building the yeah, nicest <laughs> rifle ever. Then people don't ask for it. They didn't want to take pictures. Right. <laughs> um, but anyway, I remember watching uh, you shooting at an Iptic, at Iptic Steel, and you were trying to hit, basically, I think you were trying to hit the head, so it wasn't like the whole body of it. Oh, right. But we dialed in three mils at first. It was at like 520, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, I watched you miss it. You dialed it down to 2.9, and then bang, right in the center. Right. And so... You talk about the difference of, I mean, three versus two point nine. It's point one mil difference, but it was a difference between a hit or a miss. Right. So, anyway. And I, when we did the training on this, uh, we took people out there that really didn't have uh, much shooting experience at all, and we had them shoot uh, three hundred, four hundred, and five hundred yards, just boom, 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 just by range, just by lazing with this and getting the parameters and everything put into this properly and showing them how to do that and then having them dial based on the outputs of this and the wind and, you know, inputs that they put in and mm-hmm. they were able to hit those, uh, Ipsic targets or, yeah. uh, you know, or coyote sized targets. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 Well, and then in the app, I mean, the app has all sorts of things. Now I feel like we're getting to the sales pitch part, but I just <laughs> used this like last week. Right. And so I was using, uh, gosh, what was it? It was, uh, that Barnes TTSX that Ryan, like so much and i was able to just you know go down in find that exact bullet you know enter in you know my personal velocities and things like that to go along with it but um it was cool that that you know i guess that that ab curve was like in there i could just select it and off i went makes it makes it very easy to find it it puts it all in perspective now we've we've i feel like we've made the full trip around the sun here <laughs> so to speak Talking with Nick because we got to learn a ton about lasers, which this thing has in it. And we talked with the guys from AB. Um, so I don't know by by the time this releases, if that podcast will have been out or if it's going to come out shortly. So either stay tuned or go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, we talked with those guys at AB about just all the things ballistically that, I mean, a ballistics calculator has to think of and, mm-hmm. and that some ballistician out there had to painstakingly go in and figure out so that you can just sort of hit a button and it spits out the answer. Um, but we've talked about that. We even talked with the folks from Kestrel. Mm-hmm. Again, either check that out or stay tuned um, to even just figure out how, you know, atmospherics and wind are playing into all that. And this thing is able to either communicate with all those devices or figure it all out. You know, it's it just got it all on board. Um, and, uh, yeah, after talking with all you guys and, and capping it off here with Nick, I feel like... Um, that's quite a piece of technology there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it, look at all the disciplines of, um, you know, electronics, software, optics, um, uh, yeah, optics, atmospheric measurements. I, I mean, there's so that. many disciplines. And when you, when you think about, you're talking about, you know, maybe uh, how long it has taken the industry to get some of this pulled together. It's like, look at the breadth of what you have to implement in that product. And it's pretty, pretty extensive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like, you know, we're talking about taking a little bit of time, but like when when did the first like laser rangefinder come out? I think Nice was talking about that on one of the podcasts, so like late 90s or something or mid 90s. I'd so, be curious. I don't know. I'll top my head. So we'd have to we'd have to co- we've Paul come nice was we've saying come a long way. He had one of the first ones and it was maxed at like 800 yards, I think. And yeah. that was that was a, a bit optimistic, I believe. Oh, so you're talking about the first commercially available? I'm just like yeah. a okay, commercial, yeah, yeah. like yeah. for hunting, you know. Yeah. Oh, mean, yeah. It really hasn't been all that long to no. go from that to this is pretty yeah. astounding. Yeah. And I can't believe I forgot the optics part. We have tons of podcasts, you know, with optical engineers here, too, and, and talking about optics. That's, yeah, it, it, it. It blends in. It's like a big, giant melting pot of all just a bunch of really complicated stuff that, you know, uh, I'm glad there's pros out there that know how to talk yeah, about Yeah, the, the technical terms electro optics. So if you want to sound cool and oh and super cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> super cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh you've basically got the same technology they use to uh laser bombs out of the air. So uh, exactly. So all the good. same components. <laughs> that's good. That's how you use them. <laughs> so that's uh, good to know. I feel like uh I feel like um that skeletonizer, that pulling apart model over there, Nick, by the time we're all done with this, we'll probably like engine swap it and make it a missile destroying set of binoculars. And I, that'd I was be gonna, super cool. I was going to say, stay tuned for next year when we introduce the missile button. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hey, you know what? It's 2020. Who knows what 2021 will bring? You never know when you're going to have to have that in your arsenal. The, the old missile button. Oh, that's good stuff. Uh, Nick, thanks a ton for joining us. Um, hey, anytime, guys. It was fun. I yeah. always enjoy these things. Tons of fun. Uh, Rick, thank you as well. Um, and for those listening out there, definitely um, go check this thing out. Um, now you know everything that goes into it and how neat it is. Um, and let us know what you think, too, about just lasers. I don't know. I mean, usually we always get have something we throw out there like, let's see your gun or whatever. Yeah. But in this case, I don't know if we can say, like, let's see how you do propagation yeah. of lasers through atmosphere. Um, <laughs> but you never know, Jim. You never, you never know. know. Maybe all of our listeners know and we're just the, the, the lone men out. Um, but, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. And in, in the spirit of lasers, gentlemen, this has been enlightening. So thank you very much. <laughs> God, do you know how long I've been waiting? We'll close on oh that. Oh, my gosh. We'll wow. We'll close on that. All right. Bye, everybody. I'm going to steal that, man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you, Nick. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Nick. Guys. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.